welcome back. Let's make a part, or eight parts. Uh, we need to make this connecting rod with a little bit of a kink in it. We will machine it from stainless steel 14305, that's in the NZ world 303 stainless, which machines quite nicely. This is cold drawn stock, it's almost to size. Well, it's not to size, not at all. It's completely oversized, of course. Due to the shape and the number of radii on here, we're going to machine most of it on the CNC router. The only thing that we're going to do manually is we will put those two holes in, 6H7 and 8H7, which are both reamed fits, plus zero, plus something like 20 microns. have to look that up. But in reality, you just use a 6H7 and an 8H7 h7 reamer uh, we'll put those two holes in then we'll make a fixture where this part can go on we'll machine the first side on a cnc router 3d machining because lots of radii then on the fixture we will flip it around and machine the back side and hopefully have it match up nicely that shouldn't be too much work i need to make eight means i cut nine pieces of stock those nine pieces of stock get center drilled or spot drill in this case pre-drilled for reaming a small chamfer that's helpful for the reamer then a 6h7 machine reamer and then the same story again for the other hole diameter 8h7 Spot drilling, drilling, countersinking, and reaming. The stock I had on hand is 10 mm thick, and I need a final thickness of 6.1 mm. So I'm taking the 50 mm face mill, running at 1000 rpm, and I, I take the stock to final thickness taking off an equal amount of material from both sides of my raw piece to keep the distortion at a minimum. This is cold drawn stock which has quite a bit of, of internal stresses and by keeping the material removal on both sides equal it, it levels out the, the distortion. This is the fixture I'm going to use to hold the parts on the CNC router. This is a piece of aluminium extruded flat bar and I just held it in the vise. Milled too flat on the back so it sits nicely on the parallels because extruded stock is not flat or parallel. Uh, then I clamped it on upside down or in the right orientation. Milled the top, just a strip here slightly wider than the part we're going to make and I drilled two holes uh, the same distance as in my parts and I counterboard them on this side I have a six millimeter OD drill bushing in here and this side has a eight millimeter OD drill bushing in the trick is I have a thread below it, it below the, the Below the drill bushing there is an M3 thread on this one and an M6 on this side. But if you look closely on the right one, it's not round anymore. I, did, I made it diamond pin shaped. Uh, diamond pins are a very common item in jig and fixture building. It's an off-the-shelf item. You will, will find them in every uh, standard parts catalog like uh, Misumi or Norlem. I don't think if that they make hollow diamond pins. So I make them myself because I find them a, a rather useful item. There's a drill bushing that I took to the D-bit grinder and just ground three flats on it. So, or better, four flats. So it's still about eight millimeters in this direction. I polished it down a little bit. But in every, every other direction, it's below eight millimeters. It's in, in length direction, it's only 7.8 anymore. And across the flats, it's way less. And you do that in fixture design to not over constrain your part. We have a, we have a part with two features. 
to around features to locate it. The first one locates X and Y. If you put the part on here, it's located in X and Y, can't move side to side or up and down, but it still can rotate. A second pin would do the same, would locate the other feature in X and Y and also remove the rotating ability of the part. The problem is it would be over constrained because we have X and Y twice. In Y it's not a problem because that constrains the rotation of the part, but in X it's over constrained because it's depending that the drilled distance in the part and on the fixture is always dead nuts the same. If not, you don't get the part on, or only with force, means a hammer. You don't want to hammer on a fixture. For that reason, you modify the second pin like this, so it's only locating in this direction, or the other direction, of course, uh, plus minus y. And if we put the part on now, it goes very nicely on the left pin and on the right pin. <gasps> then it cannot rotate and it can also not move in X, Y. The problem is uh, it still can lift off because it's not held down. But remember, we have these drill bushings, they are hollow, so we can pass a screw through them. That's maybe a little bit long of a screw, but you get the idea. Screw those two screws in. A screw alone, if it's not a registering bolt, is not a locating item. Because the screw thread has always clearance in the, in the clearance hole. That's why it's called clearance hole. Um, but with the precision drill bushings, it's located pretty good. And that, that's, that's, I, I learned that on my day job. Um, I often had to reference off parts with existing holes, for example, laser cut blanks that we then profiled on the CNC because we needed the, the surface finish of the mill compared to a laser cut part. And that's where I came up with, with uh, using drill bushings as a hollow locating pin and as a hollow diamond pin. So I'm not sure if this is a commercial item, probably it is because I had to see it somewhere to adapt to it. Uh, but that's the way I do it or like to do it. So let's take this fixture, let's take it out of the vise and show you the back side. Uh, here you can see the two strips that I milled in the beginning to make it sit flat on the parallels because as I said before uh, extruded bar is not exactly flat and parallel and straight and nothing. So I, I milled it parallel on, on the width, then I cut these two strips here, then I cut this middle strip at as the locating flat for the part and uh, then I did the drilling work. These two drill bushings are, uh, if I can get the part off, these two drill bushings are loctited into the counter sinks and the counter bores uh, with Loctite 648. So these are a pretty good fit and shouldn't move on their own. So here we go, that's, that's the fixture. Let's go to the CNC. The fixture is held in the vise on the CNC router and I'm using a dial and test indicator to center on the left pin of the fixture. That's also my zero point in the CAM program. Cleaning off the fixture and the first part goes on. Thanks to the diamond pin on the right side, putting the part on is very easy. Adding two screws. Uh, the machine is measuring the, the length of the tool. The tool is a 4mm 4 flute bullnose end mill. Getting my C height on the stock 
I like to program off the top of my stock if the stock is a precise height. And I drop the cutter below the height of the gauge pin or end mill shank I'm using. And then I'm jogging slowly up until the shank passes through under the cutter. And here is my first attempt in cutting the profile of this part, which ran very well. Um, I'm using the 4mm 4 flute cutter at 12,000 RPM and a feed of roughly 1800 millimeters per minute. And I'm just spiraling down the whole profile at a with a pitch of 0.1 millimeter. The problem is, while this works excellent, especially with bullnose end mill, which has a corner radius and can take quite a beating, the problem is I have those pieces of stock sticking out the side, which don't get removed completely. They get cut, cut away from the stock. And then you have those loose pieces, and in a in a in a second. You will see what happens when one of these pieces gets caught in the wrong way between the end mill and the part. And still going good. And here we go with the part. This one just fly away, which is good. This one also took quite a hefty cut. I stopped here and I should have stopped here completely and not continued. But people are dumb. You can see what's happening here part gets jammed up and there is the end mill gone. Here is my changed process. I'm using a adaptive clearing strategy which I run at full depth of the, of the part and a relatively small step over to clear away all the material. And that way I don't have to deal with any cutoffs that get caught between the cutter and the part. And you can see that this strategy always goes Climb cutting, I could set it to, to a mixed strategy where it mixes climb and conventional cut, but I prefer not to do that. And it also it also prevents the cutter always from from going into a full slotting cut. It always keeps the same chip load. Ex except for lead in and lead out, of course. Here we are just running a finishing pass at the full depth with a reduced feed. And I can get away with using the same end mill for roughing and finishing of the profile because I did my roughing at the full flute length of the cutter and I'm not wearing a groove into the cutter. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing down the whole length of the cutter evenly. Means I don't get any streaks or stripes when I do my finishing pass with the same end mill. After I had all of them profiled out I came back to them and I used a 4mm 4 flute 0.5mm corner radius bullnose end mill to do the 3D work on these parts. First I'm using a adaptive clearing strategy to neck down the, the section between those two bosses. Then I'm using a profile strategy which just follows the, the shape of the 3D model and creates the, the side profile, in this case the radius. The last operation is a flatlands operation which just finishes the area between those two bosses to the final C height. And here we can see the part coming off the fixture after the first side is completely finished. Taking out the screws. And the part comes off very nice and very easy. Make sure the fixture is clean, compressed air, and the next part goes on. Screws goes in and repeat that eight times. For the second side, we can use exactly the same fixture, just with the part flipped around. As you can see now the, 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 
the bend and the part is facing the other direction. So here you can see the model of the uh, front front end or wheel loader, a leap hair. Currently for testing, these parts were 3D printed, so he could figure out the perfect shape here with a close up. And these will be replaced by the stainless parts that I made. This gives you some context about where these parts go and what they are for. For finishing, these parts go in the vibratory tumbler with some abrasive media. This evens out all the remaining tool marks and gives a nice overall finish. This is the media I'm using. These are pyramid shaped plastic stones with a abrasive embedded. And these work very well for material removal and an even finish. The finished parts after vibratory tumbling and cleaning, as you can see, they come out pretty nice and are ready to be shipped. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.